did the research on the Stonewall book, it was clear that a lot of people who really you know, came forward as early leaders, they often had you know, a, a strong sense of self-esteem in the beginning, like Craig Rodwell, uh, Arthur Evans is one, uh, and uh, you know, this is clear you got, you know, it may not have been in terms of your sexual orientation, it's clear you, you had the support of your family, which was, I think, important for you, you know, so it shows how all these, these childhood influences can be very, you know, strong in predicting in the future, and you had the activists thing at the beginning, that's great. Well, here's where I got to thank my brothers and sisters who gave the race fund. I had the support of my family, which told me to go out and fight, because they had to fight for women's rights, black rights, fight to live in Russia, period. Um, and then there was the Holocaust. Let's not even bring all that in. Then I came to New York as whatever I was, and I met my brothers and sisters in gay liberation front. And let me tell you, as I say in the book, we were the most dysfunctional organization that ever existed in this community. But that dysfunctionality created the energy that created what we now call gay community. And the fights inside gay, the gay liberation front, and the debates that sometimes went halfway through the night, taught me how to debate, taught me how to be a leader, taught me how to be strong. Um, so when I'm asked today what got me to where I'm at today, I say my family and Gay Liberation Front. Those literally were the two influences that put me where I am now. Okay. But picking up the story again, your, your position to move here, you know, the media is such a, a common thread uh, throughout your history. You know, your actual impetus to came here came from the media from seeing you know, the TV guy that David Sussman was going to interview homosexuals on TV. So maybe you could uh, give us a quick overview from uh, the, the David Susskind story through founding Gay. Oh, good. Yeah. Actually, on the media, we'd go a little further. Uh, sure. So I go to New York because uh, there are no gay people in Philadelphia. <laughs> that is my assumption because up until 1969 and basically GLF, because Stonewall got very little press at the time. But up until the Gay Liberation Front, uh, we had very little. Up, up until that point, if you were religious, we were immoral. If you were in uh, the judicial system, we were illegal. If you were in the medical profession, we just happened to be insane. If you were government, we were unemployable. And if you owned the bar and restaurant, you couldn't serve homosexuals. You would lose your license. If uh, you would turn on the radio, we would never be talked about. If you turn on the TV, there were no gay characters. If you turn on the news, there were no news stories. If you looked in your magazine, we didn't exist. If you looked in your library, for the most part, we did not exist. We were invisible. So, in 1968, CBS did its first documentary on the homosexuals. It was moderated by Mike Wallace, um, and it was absolutely horrendous. Not one gay face was shown on the entire hour-long show. The only place that we were present anywhere was on PBS on a show called The David Susskind Show, where he had done several shows where he had gay people. One show he did, his first show he ever did, gay people actually had uh, paper bags on their heads. Um, that he did another show with Dick Light, which I believe is the one that I saw when I was 13 years old. Uh, and Philadelphia was on Channel 12, which is the PBS station. Uh, after that, between that period of time uh, with David Susskind, up until about 1970, we, did, we very rarely appear. Then, uh, several people from GAA, and I believe 71, uh, zapped the Dick Cavett show and said, why don't you have more gay people on? Uh, and then those ideas from that 1969, 71 year for me, when I was back in Philadelphia, started to bring home to me. Okay, if we're really going to be what we say we're going to be, the world has to get to know who we are. And since media isn't showing us, we're going to have to show media ourselves. And that's when I created something called the Gay Raiders and the Campaign Against Networks. So from 1972 through the end of 73, we started disrupting live network television shows. Uh, and the granddaddy of them all, which I guess when I die will still be said, is um, the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. Um, the CBS Evening News was broadcast live, and in those days there were, were no cable stations. 
It was on the ABC, NBC, CBS, and then PBS. Uh, and the, the daddy of them all was the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. He would get 60 million Americans watching his show every night. Um, so one night when he was... That was when the population was a lot less. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was an amazing rating that can't be comparable to anything today, including the Super Bowl. Um, so uh, after the first commercial, he was reading security procedures for them, uh, Henry Kissinger, and at that point, their security broke up because I walked in front of the camera between Walter Cronkite and the camera and held the sign up and shouted, gays protest CBS prejudice, at which point the CBS network uh, went blank for seven minutes, and they wrapped me in cable on the floor. Uh, we were taken out, taken to trial, uh, and at the trial, uh, they broke halfway through the trial, and to uh, set up a camera to show the tape of the disruption. Uh, I was talking to my lawyer, Hal Wiener, and who's still around, by the way, still doing civil rights work, I understand. And I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turn around, the man says, you must be Mark Siegel. I look at him, I go, you must be Walter Cronkite. He says, why did you do what you did? And I said, because your show is biased and censors LGBT news, gay, gay and lesbian news. Uh, he took umbrage to that. And I said, if I can prove that you do, will you change it? And he said, certainly, but you can't. I said, well, let's see. Uh, a few weeks ago, you covered 5,000 women walking down 6th Avenue proclaiming International Women's Year. Did you? He said, yes, it was a valid story. I said, absolutely, it was a valid story. So why didn't you cover when 15,000 gay men and lesbian women walked down the same avenue? He was silent. I said, last week, you did your first story on gay rights, aside from, of course, me disrupting your show. That story was that you reported that New York City uh, refused to pass a gay rights bill for the third time. He said it was a valid news story. I said, you know what, it really was. But why didn't you report on the 26 other cities that have already passed gay rights legislation? He didn't say a word. He turned around, walked into the courtroom. Uh, he was next up to testify. When he testified, the federal prosecutor, because we were being charged federally because we'd broken federal uh, law. And if we were found guilty, we'd have been charged $10,000 in 10 years of prison. Um, so the federal prosecutor asked him, um, when those people trespassed into your studio, and Walter said, excuse me, we invited them in. <laughs> so I didn't get charged $10,000 in 10 years of prison. <laughs> the following week, if you would have looked at the CBS Evening News when they came back from the first commercial, there was a map of the United States, and there was Walter standing up. Remember, he always used to sit behind his desk with a pointer, and he started pointing out cities and passed gay rights legislation. Wow. Um, Walter and I later, Walter and I later became friends, um, and that was thanks to him. Nothing that I did. Um, to this day, he, I, I can say, he's one of the most generous people I've ever met in my life. Um, and help the LGBT cause a great deal. Well, it was your, your mother's illness that brought you back to Philadelphia from New York, and you came, then you, you kept up your activism there. Um, maybe you'd like to say just a little more about, well, I think we've got some much Carl leave that aside. It's kind of implicit in why you had to do Zaps at the time. Um, but then you went from using the media as an outsider through Zaps to becoming an owner of a newspaper, the Philadelphia Gay News, still being published. Uh, an excellent newspaper. Uh, what was that like, starting a gay newspaper in a major American city in the 1970s? Well, the transformation was kind of stark, and it's very best way to put it, I guess. Um, after I did the Cronkite Zap, and I also did uh, the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, uh, the Today Show where Barbara Walters, where I got to disrupt Barbara Walters. After I did all of that, uh, at that point, for about a year and a half, I was probably the best known gay activist in the nation. And so I was doing all the talk shows and getting in magazines, and I felt that was my job. It was my job without a salary because I wasn't getting paid by anybody. Because in those days, we didn't have high salary CEOs of gay organizations. But my belief was that my job was to get us in front of the public 
because they got to know us, they'll talk about us. Um, that's the way for real liberation. Uh, so my friend Jim Austin in Pittsburgh, on Pittsburgh Gay News, asked me to uh, come out and speak, speak and promote his newspaper. And I did after that. He said, why don't you have a newspaper like this in Philadelphia? And I said, no one's done it. And he said simply, why don't you do it? And I said, I don't know anything about putting out a newspaper. And he says, well, I'll do it with you and I'll teach you. Um, so that's how Philadelphia Gay News began. And nine months after we began, I was um, going a little too fast for him. And he said, you know, I've been in this business my whole life. I think I'll get out of it. And he basically sold both newspapers to me for a dollar. Wow. How did that media deal? Uh, a great media deal, and we are still friends to this day. Um, and he told me just a few weeks ago that he was very proud of what I've done with, with the paper. Well, he should be. He should be.